told you that a simple daily pill could help you lose over 11% of your body weight in just 72 weeks without needles or injections. Well, that's exactly what the Attain One trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine just showed us. I'm here to break down this groundbreaking study for you. For those new to the channel, we critically analyze the latest medical literature to help you stay current with evidence-based medicine. If you find this content valuable, please hit that like button and subscribe. It really helps the channel grow. Let's start with why this matters. We're facing a global obesity crisis affecting over 2.5 billion adults worldwide. Current GLP-1 receptor agonists like semaglutide and terzepatide are incredibly effective, achieving 15 to 20% weight loss, but they're all injectable. This creates real barriers, patient reluctance to use injections, cold storage requirements, and limited scalability in resource-constrained settings. Oral semaglutide exists, but it comes with significant restrictions. You must fast for 30 minutes, take it with minimal water, and avoid food for another 30 minutes. Enter Orforglipron, a small molecule, left non-peptide GLP-1 agonist with up to 40% bioavailability and no dietary restrictions. This could be a game changer for accessibility and adherence. The Attain One trial seeks to answer the question, does once daily Orforglipron improve weight loss and cardiometabolic risk compared to placebo in non-diabetic overweight adults? The Attain One trial was well-designed, a phase three multinational, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study across 137 sites in nine countries. They enrolled 327 adults with key inclusion criteria being BMI of more than 30 or BMI 27 than 30 with complications like hypertension or sleep apnea. Subjects must have had a history of unsuccessful dietary weight loss attempts. Importantly, they excluded patients with diabetes. This was specifically for non-diabetic obesity. They enrolled 3,127 adults with a mean age of 45, BMI of 37, and notably 64% were female. Participants were randomized 3333-4 to receive orfogliprone 6 mg, 12 mg, 36 mg, or placebo daily for 72 weeks. They used a careful dose escalation protocol over 8 to 20 weeks to minimize gastrointestinal side effects. The primary endpoint was percent weight change at 72 weeks using a treatment regimen estimate, which is more stringent than some other obesity trials. Primary outcome was percentage weight loss amongst subjects, whilst key secondary outcomes included reductions in waist circumference, systolic blood pressure, LDL cholesterol, and triglyceride levels. Adverse events were also recorded. The results were impressive and dose-dependent. Mean weight loss at 72 weeks was 7.5% for 6 mg, 8.4% for 12 mg, and 11.2% for the highest 36 mg dose compared to just 2.1% with placebo. All comparisons were highly statistically significant with p-value less than 0.001. But here's what's clinically meaningful. In the 36 mg group, 54.6% of patients achieved at least 10% weight loss, compared to only 12.9% with placebo, and 36% achieved the more ambitious 15% weight loss threshold. The cardiometabolic benefits were equally impressive. There were significant improvements in waist circumference, a 10 cm reduction versus 3.1 cm with placebo, systolic blood pressure dropped by 5.7, triglycerides fell by 14.8, and non-HDL cholesterol decreased by 6.7. The trial completion rate was excellent at 85.1%, suggesting good tolerability. The safety profile was consistent with the GLP-1 class. Gastrointestinal events were the most common, nausea, diarrhea, constipation, and vomiting, but these were generally mild to moderate and occurred mainly during dose escalation. Discontinuation rates due to GI events ranged from 3.5% to 7% across the orforglipron doses versus just 0.4% with placebo. There were five cases of mild pancreatitis confirmed by adjudication, but no severe hypoglycemia or medullary thyroid cancer. Importantly, there was a modest increase in heart rate of four to five beats per minute, which is typical for this drug class. Major adverse cardiovascular events were rare and balanced across groups. This trial had several notable strengths that enhance our confidence in the results. First, the scale and diversity. Over 3,000 patients from four continents with strong male representation at 35%, which is higher than many historical obesity trials. 
The methodological rigor was excellent. It was well-powered at greater than 90% with appropriate multiplicity adjustment for secondary endpoints. The 72-week duration with high retention rates gives us confidence in sustained effects. Most importantly, the comprehensive endpoint assessment went beyond just weight loss to include extensive cardiometabolic biomarkers, body composition analysis, and quality of life measures. This gives us a complete picture of the drug's impact. However, we need to discuss some important limitations that affect how we interpret these results. The most significant is the lack of an active comparator. While placebo-controlled trials are essential, clinicians really want to know how orforgliprone compares to existing treatments like injectable semaglutide or terzepatide. Interestingly, Eli Lilly recently presented head-to-head -head data comparing orforgliprone to oral semaglutide in the ACHIEVE-3 trial, where orforgliprone showed superior efficacy. But we still lack direct comparisons to the injectable agents that are currently considered the gold standard. The population limitations are also worth noting. By excluding diabetics, we're missing a huge population where these drugs are commonly used. The BMI cutoffs were based on white populations, which may not optimally reflect risk in other ethnic groups. Finally, the increasing availability of obesity medications during the trial period may have affected retention and generalizability. This is a real-world consideration as the treatment landscape evolves rapidly. So what does this mean for clinical practice? An effective oral GLP-1 option could dramatically expand access to this class of medications. The convenience factor is huge. No injections, has no cold storage, no complex dosing requirements. Recent expert commentary suggests this could particularly benefit patients who are injection-averse or live in areas with storage limitations. The cost structure may also be different. Oral formulations are generally less expensive to manufacture than complex injection devices. However, we need to be realistic about the efficacy gap. The 11.2% weight loss, while clinically meaningful, falls short of what we see with high-dose injectable agents like semaglutide 2.4 mg or terzepatide 15 mg, which can achieve 15 to 20% weight loss. The key question is whether the convenience and accessibility benefits outweigh this efficacy difference for many patients. Here's my bottom line on Attain 1. This represents a significant advance in obesity pharmacotherapy. Or 4 glipron offers clinically meaningful, dose-dependent weight loss with a safety profile consistent with the GLP-1 class. The oral formulation could dramatically improve access and adherence for many patients. However, we need head-to-head -head comparisons with existing therapies, real-world effectiveness data, and careful attention to cost-effectiveness as this moves toward approval. This brings us to some important questions for discussion. First, how do we optimize patient selection for oral versus injectable GLP-1 agents? Should orforgliprone be positioned as first-line therapy for injection-averse patients, or as step-up therapy after lifestyle interventions fail? Secondary, what are the broader healthcare system implications? Cost-effectiveness analyses will be crucial, especially given the scale of the obesity epidemic and current concerns about GLP-1 drug costs. The potential for improved access must be balanced against overall healthcare budgets. What are your thoughts on oral GLP-1 agents? Do you think the convenience factor justifies potentially lower efficacy compared to injectables? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. I read every single one and often respond. If this analysis was helpful, please give it a like and consider subscribing for more evidence-based medicine content. Hit the notification bell so you don't miss our next Journal Club discussion. Until next time, keep questioning, keep learning, and keep practicing evidence-based medicine.